In this video, we are going to summarize what you have learned so far in this course, and we will give a short outlook on what is to come. So first of all, let's uh, look at the table of contents here. So we are at the end of chapter four, and in the first four chapters, what we have basically talked about, besides some very basic Python, is how we translate the, the logic behind a problem uh, into code. And uh, this is what uh, we, uh, as a, pro a software developer, would call the so-called business logic. So it has nothing to do with the business in terms of making money, um, but the business logic of a problem is basically the rules as to how the, the, the algorithm should run. So how should the code iterate uh, to solve a problem, what are the if-else logics built in, and so on. That is what we refer to as the business logic. And then from uh, now on, what we are going to talk about is we are going to center each of the um, chapters around a particular data type. And then we go into detail and learn about what this data uh, type uh, can do, uh, how it works, and uh, what we need it for. Okay, so um, in the next videos, we are going to look at numbers in particular, how numbers work, what do we need to know about numbers, and then text and so on, um, and much more. And then um, chapter 11, classes, this will uh, enable us to write our own data type. So at some point we will reach um, um, a point where we cannot simply um, work with the basic data types that Python comes with. So that is then when we uh, start to develop our own uh, data types to solve some uh, particular problems. Okay, so um, that is uh, a short outlook. And now in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to classify um, the chapters that are to come, the data types that are to come, okay? So let's uh, create a new file and call it overview on data types. Okay, so classifying data types. So first of all, what you need to understand is the idea that there are so-called abstract data types and then there are also so-called concrete data types. So what do I mean by that? So the easy concept is the concrete one. So a concrete data type is any data type that the built-in function type may return, okay? We have uh, seen this function in use. So as an example, if I ask Python, what is the type of the number one? I get back int, okay? And int is a concrete data type. And the concrete data type is something that I can use to create new objects of this data type. So we um, saw the notion of a constructor. A constructor is basically a class, that is a technical term, and a constructor is basically a concrete data type that we can call to create um, new objects of this data type. So what we did as, as an example was, let's take the number 7.1, the floating point number, and uh, if I pass that to the int constructor, then I get back seven as an integer, so that is what I mean by a concrete data type. I can use it to create concrete objects. Okay, and now in this video, we will uh, go ahead and we will classify concrete data types into uh, abstract ones. Okay, and one such classification is basically already the notion of a number or numbers in plural. So what kind of data types do we know um, exist there for numbers? Well, um, as we just saw, there is a data type called the int type. And this is what we um, use to model um, whole natural numbers, or let's simply say natural numbers, okay? So as we saw before, examples are simply, for example, the number one. And then we also saw another data type already, which is the floating point data type. And this is um, what we um, use mainly to model um, decimal numbers. And I will put the word decimal in quotes. And maybe we can actually get rid of decimal. The, the reason why I don't like the term decimal is because decimal happens to be also a concrete data type as we will learn in one of the future videos. So maybe let's replace that with irrational numbers. 
Yeah, you should know that from high school. Um, there are the natural numbers n in math terms. There are the um, fractional numbers q, um, and then there are also the, the real numbers. Maybe we we'll also could do that. That's probably a better term to use. Real numbers, the the set of r in math, and then the next set that we would have is a set of so-called complex numbers, and this also exists in Python. So let's first go ahead and um, create an example of a floating point number. Well, quite easily just uh, we write it like this, and we will look in the numbers chapter in detail um, of other ways to how to construct numbers and so on. But one more example that we have not seen in this course so far is the so-called cl complex uh, data type. And of course, the complex data type, the, con the concrete complex data type, is there to model complex numbers, of course. And complex numbers for a data scientist, a practitioner, are kind of on the edge of do you really want to study them or not? So. Um, my guess is for a beginner's course, uh, no need to go into detail here. Um, but let's say uh, you want to really go into data science uh, like a deep dive, then you need to understand some mathematical concepts. In particular, you need to study linear algebra in detail. And in order to do that, it is quite worthwhile to know about complex numbers by you know from your math course, but also it is worthwhile to know how to use them in, in code. Okay, but now um, let's uh, take one level back here. So um, this is basically examples of concrete data types and the way we classify them, this is what we mean by an abstract data type. So um, what do we mean, why, why do we call that abstract? Well, all the numbers share similar behavior, okay? So in other words, when I say I classify concrete data types into abstract ones, what we really do is we basically classify uh, common behavior, okay? And so what are behaviors that all the numbers um, share together? Well, for example, very trivial example, we can simply add them. So I can add one plus two, but I can also add uh, two floating point numbers. So let's take the 7.1 and add it to 42.3, okay? So um, addition is shared among uh, all the numerical data types. And uh, we will look into that in the next videos in detail. So that's just one classification scheme. Another very important classification scheme is, of course, textual data, or, for, or simply text for short. So um, in the very first um, chapter, we already saw how we can model text. So in Python, what we do is we use the double quotes to um, wrap any text that we want to um, model in our program. And as, I, as we see here, when I enter that into a code cell, I get back random text with single quotes. And I said that before, double quotes and single quotes are perfect synonyms. So Python defaults to single quotes. But um, in recent uh, years, uh, my guess is that um, the majority of the Python community started to prefer the double quotes. And uh, this has to do with some code formatting tool uh, called Black, which uh, basically um, styles code in a uniform way. And this tool just uh, prefers uh, the double quotes over the single quotes but um, some programmers still use the single quotes and uh, it's perfectly okay in Python because in Python they have no different meaning, okay? That is also different to other languages. In some other programming languages, uh, single quotes are often used to mean individual characters and the double quotes are used to mean uh, more than a single character, so words and, and sentences, but in Python it's pretty much the same. So it's, a, it's not pretty much the same, it is the same. Okay, so that's um, an example of textual data. And um, in terms of behavior, um, what you could do is, well, you could, for example, go ahead and let's uh, copy paste um, the text here. And we could use some method that um, basically uh, can only work with textual data. So for example, the dot upper function or method. So the upper method simply uppercases um, the text. There's also, of course, the title method and so on. Okay, so what data type is this? What are we working with? Well, if we go ahead and use Python's uh, type function to find out what data type we're looking at, it is of course the string data type, string, okay? And the string, the term comes from a string of characters, okay? That is the, why we call it a string for short. So um, yeah, and uh, usually uh, string is pretty much the same technical term across all other uh, major programming languages as well. So we can um, put that here into our header and say this is simply the string type to model so-called Unicode text or Unicode characters. 
And what Unicode characters are, uh, we will learn in the, video, in the videos regarding chapter six. Um, so for now, for short, uh, Unicode basically means any letter that in any language uh, in humankind uh, that ever existed. So we can model any kind of text, even smileys and, and other things. But we will look into detail uh, once we do that. Then there is another data type that also goes through as textual data. And uh, that may be new for some of you. So I will give you the type. The type is called the so-called bytes data type. And uh, this is um, basically um, how text looks like or what text looks like for a computer. Okay, so this is basically the, yeah, the, the, um, the version that is uh, close to the memory. And um, this has to do with a couple of conventions of how the zeros and ones inside a computer's memory uh, can be parsed into letters and words. We won't go into detail here. I just give you that as a second example so that you see that textual data as an abstract data type classifies more than one uh, concrete data type, namely string and bytes. And we will look into detail in the chapter on textual data. Okay, so now let's um, go ahead and uh, look at the next uh, idea, the next abstract idea. And this is the idea of a so-called collection. Okay, let's do it like this, collection. So um, what is a collection? So a collection in Python um, basically um, summarizes three properties uh, into one. So the first property is what we refer to, maybe let's make a list here, we refer to that as the so-called container property. And the idea is that um, an object, and this can be anything, so it cannot be anything, of course, it, it is going to be a collection object, but any object that um, contains references to other objects is what we refer to as a container. And uh, an example of that, so let me first write that, an, an object or any object that is basically the proper definition, any object that holds references to other objects. And as, as an example, let's simply use lists, okay? Because we have seen lists in this course uh, before. And um, so lists is, um, or list objects are container objects. So this is an abstract property. So maybe let's also write there any object that fulfills these properties. The second um, property is the property that um, we call, um, yeah, the length. That is probably the best way to put it. There are also more formal words for that, but let's simply um, call it uh, the length here. So any object that holds a finite number, and the, the emphasis is on the finite, a finite number of references. And now you may wonder, so an example for that would also be a list, because a list, um, as we saw before, um, is just finite. So you may wonder, isn't any object kind of finite? Because the computer memory must be finite, so we cannot just put infinite number of things inside an object. And the answer to that is, that is true, of course, um, memory is finite, but there are technical ways uh, in which we can model infinite data streams. And we will see that um, in the chapter eight, uh, which is uh, called MFR, so it is short for Map Filter Reduce. And in this chapter, we are going to learn about data types that enable us to model an infinite number of objects, okay? So, um, and the opposite of that would be an object, so for example, a list object that has a finite number of things, and any object that has a finite number of things in it is what we call a length, uh, wh wh where we say it has a length. The technical term, maybe let's put it here as well, it's called a sized object, okay? So this is how um, it is specified in the Python reference. Okay, and the third, um, the third property is the property that we are going to refer to as iterable. Okay, and this is simply any object over which we can loop. And an example for that is also list. So maybe let's go ahead and copy paste the example up here because the list fulfills all three properties, of course. So let's make this one dash. 
And any object that fulfills all these three objects together is what we refer to as a collection, okay? So if we go ahead and uh, let's go to the Python documentation, maybe let's go into the library reference and let's maybe go into the site where we have spent most time so far in this course, the page with the uh, built-in functions. If, for example, we search for a uh, term, let's say iterable, we see that being used as the name of a parameter in many, many functions. So I have here only on this page 68 um, hits uh, regarding the search of iterable. And so in other words, whenever in the documentation you read the term iterable, the only thing that is important is you can pass in any object, so any concrete data type that we can loop over. And for that, an example for that would of course also be a list object. Okay, um, let's see if we um, find more of these technical terms here. Let's maybe check for container. And here we see, um, this is not a container, but let's see if we find that here. Uh, in the documentation here it says, in a section that is so far not important to us because we will discuss dictionaries in the future um, video, but here it says, for other containers see blah, blah, blah. Okay, and whenever you see the, the word container, well, basically what you can think of is any object that um, contains some, uh, some other uh, objects, okay? And now let's briefly go ahead and make an example. So let's take a list of numbers and um, let's put a couple of numbers in here. 10 numbers are enough. And now let's see, at, let's see how we can connect those three properties to operators. So in other words, any, any object that um, supports this particular operator that we are about to see is an example of a container, a lengthy object, or an iterable. So for the container property, there is the so-called in operator. So the in operator, let's maybe put that here, in operator, is what implements um, so-called membership testing. And membership testing um, it simply um, basically simply means we, we look up if the operand on the left hand side is a member of the object on the right hand side. So for example, I could um, ask the question if the number zero is in numbers. And the answer is of course false. Similarly, I could say, is the number seven in numbers? And the answer would be true, okay? The fact that um, the, the list object numbers here supports um, the in operator so in other words, we can use in with numbers or a list object as the right-hand uh, oper operand. This suggests and that the object is a container object. Okay, so that is the, how we can check the property. There are also other ways that I specify in the book um, how you can check if the, if the property is fulfilled or not, but using the in operator is the, the simplest one. And the in operator is also abstract in the, in the sense that it simply checks um, if the left-hand operand is inside or is contained by the right-hand operand, it does not um, implement how this check is done, okay? And different data types will do this check in different ways. So for example, in a list, in a list case, um, what we do is a so-called linear search. So behind the scenes, and we don't see that as a Python programmer, what happens with the in operator is Python will basically loop over all the elements from left to right. And once it finds one, that matches the one we are looking for, it returns true. It ends the, it ends the loop, it's a short circuiting. We've seen that concept in a previous video. And it simply says, okay, I found one occurrence of the left-hand operand in the, in the uh, container. So yeah, so it's in there, it's true. And in the case where the answer is false, what happened was behind the scenes, Python loops over all the numbers through the entire list until the very end. And once it reaches the end, it sees, okay, I haven't found what I'm looking for, so um, the answer must be false. And different data types, in particular the set data type and the dictionary data type that we will see in future videos, they work different in that regard. So the linear search uh, may be very, uh, very slow when we have a list with, let's say, one million numbers in it, okay? So um, this operation uh, may take some time. It, may, it takes exactly linear time, as the computer scientists would say. And there are other data types, uh, in particular set and dictionary, that go much faster. And we will see in future videos why this is the case. Okay, so uh, for now, simply uh, note that any object that supports the in operator, abstractly speaking, no matter how it's implemented, um, is a container object. 
let's go further and let's um, let's see how we can check the sized property and the way to do that is quite simple and we saw that before we simply go ahead and use the built-in function len pass to it as the uh, argument um, numbers and i get back 10 and uh, any object that supports being used with the uh, len function um, is an um, is an is a sized object okay so let's maybe um, see two counter examples um, of objects where these two operations don't work. So for example, using the in operator, let's say if I'm given the number 123, I could try to use the in operator just like this. I could say, uh, is the number one in 123, in the number 123? And we could think, semantically speaking, that this should be true because the number one is indeed a digit inside the number. However, the in operator um, gives me a type error and it says, argument of type int, so the right hand side, is, that is what it means, is not iterable. And the not iterable um, is kind of misleading here um, because we are still working with the um, membership testing operator, the in operator. So what we would uh, um, defer from uh, this uh, code cell is that um, the number 123, the integer object, is not a container because it does not support the int operator. And the reason why it's um, an iterable is because, why it says here iterable is because um, what Python would do is it would basically loop over the digits, so to say, from left to right in a linear search. And that is why uh, this, uh, the, the error message here is a bit misleading. But really um, what we see here that uh, the number 123, the integer object, is not a container. Similarly, if I go ahead and um, ask Python, hey, what is the length of the num number 123? I also get a type error. So we could think, uh, of a situation where I get back the number three as the answer because I have three digits inside the integer, but that is not, uh, th that doesn't work, okay? And the reason why is because the integer data type, the concrete integer data type is not a sized um, object, okay? So these are two counter examples and usually you get a type error when you use uh, the wrong type with some uh, operation, with some operator or some built-in function here. So let's uh, quickly um, finish this discussion here. So um, the, loop, uh, the looping nature, we can simply check by saying for number in numbers, let's say print number, let's print everything on one line and it works. So we can loop over numbers, therefore it is iterable, okay? So these are three properties that make up the term collection, the big idea of a, of a collection. Now the collection idea itself can be broken down into several other concepts. So let's look at a couple. So the first um, so-called specialization of a collection is what we would um, refer to as a so-called sequence, okay? And this is why chapter seven here is called um, sequences or sequential data. So um, sequences are a special type of collections. So now, what is a sequence? Well, a sequence is any object that additionally fulfills this one property. And in technical terms, the property is called reversible or reversibility. What this really means is we have a forward and backward order of the contained objects. And an example for that would of course also be the list object. So let's also write that here. Also a list is an example for that. So a list is not only example for collections in general, but also for the special kind of a collection called the sequence. And you may wonder why do the, the programmers here use such a uh, weird word? Well, why wouldn't they just call it forward order? Well, the thing is, Reverse, reversible order basically implies forward order, right? If we can reverse something, there must be a forward order to begin with, otherwise we couldn't reverse it, okay? So how could you check that? Well, there is a built-in function called reversed, and the built-in function reversed um, takes, for example, a list object, and I get back some something called an iterator. We will look into what iterators are in uh, chapter eight. An iterator is basically um, the idea of um, an object which um, we can loop over, but we don't know how many elements will come out of it. So 
it's, it's like a rule in memory that uh, basically allows us to get the next thing uh, and uh, without looking beyond that. And now what could we do here? One thing we could do is we could say for number in reversed numbers, print number and and print everything on one line. And now I'm basically uh, reversing all the numbers. So I'm, I'm looping in backward order. And any object over which I can loop in backward order is a sequence, okay? And uh, sequences are probably among the most um, commonly used data types um, in programming besides uh, mappings, which we'll look into next. And uh, the reason why is because there are many applications of sequential data. So if you think of a CSV file or an Excel file, that is sequential data. A matrix, a vector, everything of that uh, is, is an example of a sequence. So there are many abstract things that can be modeled um, as sequences with the various different sequence, concrete sequence types, okay? So let's look at um, two more uh, specializations of a collection. And the next one, is what we are going to call in general terms a mapping. And an example for a mapping would be the so-called dictionary data type. So let's uh, yeah simply call it, yeah, let's write it out, dictionaries, kind of like lookup tables, but I don't want to go too much in the detail here. I simply give you an example. So an example of a dictionary would be, um, let's say I want to map numbers to text. So what we do is we write curly braces. This is new, we have not seen this in this course so far. And now I'm going ahead and I will say the number zero is going to be mapped to the word zero. The number one is going to be mapped to the number one. And the number two is going to be mapped to the word two. And let's um, assign that, let's first check what is the data type of uh, numbers to text. It's of course dictionary. And what can we do with a dictionary? So we could, for example, index into it. So we saw the indexing operator before. I index with zero, I get back the word, uh, the word zero. Okay, so there are lots of applications for that. Dictionaries are the secret of uh, how we can make our recursive version of the Fibonacci problem um, efficient. That is one of the, in one of the previous videos, we saw that the recursive implementation of Fibonacci is not efficient. It suffers from exponential growth and using dictionaries, we can actually uh, yeah, repair that. And we will look into that in, the, in a future video. Okay, so um, that is one example. And we will see further examples when we talk about mappings here, of course. And then also um, related to mappings, is the concept of a set. Yeah, let's just call it sets. And as an example, uh, as a concrete example of the abstract set idea is um, the so-called set data type. So maybe we model mathematical sets here. So let me give you one example. And uh, again, we will look into a lot of detail of why uh, the set data type and the, the dictionary data type are related um, so much, but for now, Let's go ahead and simply write curly braces. And instead of um, writing some notation with a colon and the commas here, I will skip the colon part and I will simply do this. I will go ahead and write a couple of numbers in here and I will repeat the numbers. And I will repeat the three a couple of more times. And maybe I will also go ahead and put in some unordered numbers. And let's go ahead and execute the cell and I get back a set data type. And we see, maybe we missed a nine here, so let's put in a nine also. And what we see here is that all of the redundant numbers are basically gone. And that is because that is how m sets work in mathematical um, background. So in math, an element can only be either member of a set or not be member of a set. So it's a one or zero question. You cannot be um, member of the same set more than once, okay? There are other concepts called the multi-set and so on, but for normal mathematical sets, you can only be a member of the set, either you are it or you're not it. Okay, so one or zero question. And also somehow, and this looks weird, the order is changed. So what we learn from that is that the set data type, maybe let's write here, loses the order. So in other words, uh, there is no order, okay? So maybe when above, 
when we talked about sequences and we talked about the property of being reversible, I said anything that has a, fo has a forward and a backward order, and as an example, I gave you a list. Well, now we have an example of a data type, of a concrete data type, that is definitely not ordered, okay? So the, the set data type, the, the concrete set data type in Python is unordered. By the way, the dictionary data type is also kind of unordered, but here we have to learn a little bit uh, more details about how the ordering works here. But um, you should also not rely on the order here, okay? So order is also something that needs to be modeled explicitly in, in programming. Okay, so this is um, basically, roughly speaking, um, a, um, a classification of all the concrete data types that we will uh, look at in the next uh, couple of videos in probably the second half uh, of this course. And this is also how uh, the chapters are organized. So this is the, the concept behind it. And let me repeat the, 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 the big ideas from this um, chapter here, from this video. The big idea is that you have to be able to um, understand that there are abstract concepts, abstract data types. So uh, numbers in general, for example, textual data in general, collections in general, and so on. And then there's the concept of concrete data types. And concrete data types are types that exist in Python that are built in or that later on in the chapter on classes that we can define ourselves. And uh, they model data of a certain type and um, they can be classified into the abstract data types. Maybe one thing that just comes to my mind um, in an earlier uh, video when we talked about functions in chapter two, um, we also introduced the term uh, so-called callable. And I said to you that a callable is any object that can be called. Right? So in other words, callable, maybe let's um, put that down here as the last couple of points. So a callable is of course also an abstract data type. Anything that can be called is a callable. And the concrete examples were um, the, the user-defined function that we define with a def statement, but also, and uh, this is, um, the data type of, for example, the built-in sum function is built-in method or built-in function or method. So basically, we have another example, which is the so-called built-in function or method. Okay, so we have the function type, the concrete function type, which is the user-defined function. So let's write that here, user-defined function, and also the built-in function. And also, um, maybe let's do that to finish this chapter. If I ask the question, what is the type of int, of integer, of a constructor, I get back type. And anything, any object whose type is type is what we formally refer to as a class. And uh, in this course so far, we have been um, referring to that simply as constructors, okay? So maybe let's write here, constructors. Okay, so we have three different uh, concrete data types, function, built-in function, and type that all have all share one commonality, which means they can be called. So they are all callables. Three concrete examples, one abstract example, the, the abstract classification, okay? So this is how um, a, an experienced programmer thinks. An experienced programmer um, thinks usually in abstract terms, and then it, he or she finds um, a concrete data type that fulfills the properties needed to solve some problem, and uh, then we will um, yeah, then we still need to know which, uh, how they compare, how the concrete, um, how the concrete data types compare, which advantages and disadvantages they have. But first and foremost, if you want to solve a problem, um, usually as a programmer, you kind of think in these abstract terms of how you want to break down the problem, and then you choose whatever concrete data type fits the, the abstract data type that you need, and uh, then you will simply go ahead and solve the problem. And also a nice side effect, and that is also one. Um, of the main reasons why I introduced these ideas in this course is knowing the abstract data types makes it a lot easier for you to read documentation. And I know I would not be a good teacher if, I, if my goal were not to enable you to read documentation because you should be self-reliant after this course. You should um, be able to find your own way in the Python community and solve your own problems where I cannot be of help. And uh, the number one, skill you need to develop is to read technical documentation, even if it's uh, in the beginning very hard to do so, right? And uh, knowing the abstract data types really, really makes it easy to understand um, 
the documentation here. So that is it for this uh, rather long video. And uh, now I hope you have a good overview of what is there to come. And uh, in the next uh, videos, we will look at all of these things in very much more detail. So I see you then.